I've been there at a time when, when uh, you know, it was a complete collapse of the system. And, and basically what I saw, you know, in Moscow or what I saw in Eastern Europe when I was traveling there as a student in 1990, 1991, was a complete failure, basically, you know, complete, complete failure. So in fact, Thomas Piketty is a liberal, um, you know, lots of liberal people are also worried about social inequality. I was just curious, and especially being from the left, how do you look at uh, Ma the period of Maoist China and the Soviet Union uh, in general? Yeah, uh, yeah, these are really big questions. Uh, you know, I, I was, I belong to a generation, I was born in 1971, so, you know, I became an adult in 1989, 1990, at the time of the collapse of the of the Soviet Union, Soviet bloc, and also at the time of, of Tiananmen. And so for me, for my generation, or at least for someone like me, you know, I was too young to be tempted by communism in the Soviet form or, or Maoist form. So, you know, some people who were born 10 years before me or 20 years before me or more, you know, had, had this experience as a sort of direct mm -hmm. believers in these models, which, you know, I was never tempted by this. Maybe just because it's not that I was smarter than my uh, older generation. You visited just... the Soviet Union, if I'm not wrong. Sorry, sorry? You you visited the Soviet Union. Yeah, I visited, but when it was collapsing, and, and I visited in 1991 the first time, and then 1992, and then my wife, no, my ex-wife, but she was the mother of my three older daughters, is a, is a, is a historian, actually, a social historian of the Soviet Union. So I've been many times in Moscow when she was working in the archive in the 1990s, um, uh, and, and, you know, she was sort of studying the sort of social history of the interwar period in the Soviet Union and, and at a time when archives were just opening up. Well, they actually, they have closed again since then, by the way, but there was a time in the 1990s, early 2000s, where archives were relatively open. And for the first time, it was possible to study the, the social history of the Soviet Union. And and uh, so I've, I've been there a lot, but you know, I've been there at a time when, when uh, you know, it was a complete collapse of the system. And, and basically what I saw, you know, in Moscow or what I saw in Eastern Europe when I was traveling there as a student in 1990-1991 was a complete failure, basically, you know, complete, complete failure. So, in fact, in the 1990s, I was much more liberal in my thinking and much more sort of... Uh, center left or even center uh, <laughs> to, you know, uh, so I was a much stronger free market believer than what I am now, partly because of this experience, because, right. you know, just like the world in general in the 1990s was much more free market believer because, yeah, you know, the collapse of the, of the, of the Soviet model, you know, it was so clear that it was a disaster. Now, of course, if, when I look at this today, you know, I have a more balanced view in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, starting with the Tsarist regime uh, before 1917, you know, there were achievements in terms of education, health, public infrastructure, in particular in the interwar period or until the 50s, which, you know, other regimes could have done better, other regimes could have done worse. I mean, you have to be, it's a, but, but certainly the, the complete uh, uh, refusal of any kind of, of, uh, uh, you know, democratic balance of power either in elections or in companies, you know, with, in fact, very little worker control, very little uh, in terms of democratic union. Yes, yeah, this is very different from, from the way, you know, was a, when, I, when I look at, uh, when I talk about democratic socialism or participatory socialism for the future, I'm, I, I am thinking much more in terms of uh, continuation of the social democratic model of the 20th century than uh, than of the, the communist experiment of the 20th century. So m most of what I've been doing, you know, in 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 the past uh, two or three decades, by you know revisiting the history of the distribution of income and wealth over the past two hundred years, is basically, uh, you know, to say. Okay, look, the, the Soviet communism or Maoist communism was a large uh, uh, failure, but 
you know, social democratic uh, countries in the in the in the West were able to build a, a system with bo more equality and more prosperity at the same time, which in the end, you know, has achieved a lot. And and what's important is to consider this achievement not as a frozen product, you know, not as a finished product, as a finished system, but as a first step towards something that should um, that can continue so when i you know when i talk about participatory socialism or democratic socialism by the end of the 21st century you know it's uh, it's of course very different from what we have today and it will require a very different balance of power to to get in uh, to get there but at the same time you know it's very different from the system we have today but i would say that it's not more different uh, you know as compared to the system we have today than the system we have today is different from the uh, capitalism of 1910 uh, way with uh, you know uh, no social security with uh, the, you know, the colonial uh, patriarchal uh, authoritarian uh, regime which uh, which today you know in, in you know, in spite of all the limitation in the education, uh, health system, in spite of all the problem with the uh, uh, private money in politics, in the media, which you were referring to earlier, um, uh, you know, is is as is very different from what we had a uh, hundred years ago. And uh, you know, I, I think uh, uh, you know this evolution could and should continue. So this is the way I've, I've, you know I've been thinking about that uh, in my in my research. What's your response? Thomas Piketty is a liberal. Um, you know, lots of liberal people are also worried about social inequality. In fact, even sections of the IMF and the World Bank and so on are worried about social inequality. You know, many years ago, in the 1970s, the chair of the Bank of America made a statement. He said that, you know, effectively, that if you don't manage inequality rates, they're coming to go and bomb your house. You know, there's going to be violence. Um, in, know, in in fact, sorry, in fact, in a famous lecture by uh, Amartya Sen on inequality, he said that even Robert Nozick is very concerned about inequality. So it's something which cuts across political. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was interesting when Piketty produced his book on inequality. I found it interesting that it made a big splash because, in fact, um, you know, you, you just need to travel around the world to see the evidence of inequality. And besides, the UN Conf Conference on Trade and Development in its Trade and Development Report every year has pointed this out, you know. But, I mean, the publishing world is a curious world, you know. And, I mean, data on inequality is not sufficient to understand either why inequality reproduces itself or how to undo it, you know. So I would say I caution people about seeing somebody like Thomas Piketty as an oracle about the world, because in fact, what he is, is he is somebody who I think with great scrupulous care has proved the obvious, which is that inequality exists in the world. Now, here's another obvious fact um, and historically verifiable obvious fact. Most major transformative revolutions of the 20th century took place in extremely poor and backward countries. You know, you can start with the revolutions in Mexico, 1911, the Persian revolution, your Majlis revolution, 1911 in Iran. Um, you can go to the Chinese revolution of 1911. You know, these three happened around the same time, extremely poor backward countries, you know, backward socially in terms of social indicators, literacy rates, health, and so on. Um, and the Tsarist Empire was one of the poorest parts of Europe. I mean, there were poor parts in Eastern Europe, but one of the poorest parts of Europe, vast um, agricultural terrain. Um, the, the revolutions all took place in poor countries. After the Soviet Revolution, 1917, it was Mongolia, you know, 1919. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Germany, it was Mongolia. It was the other end of the USSR, a forgotten revolution. Vietnam, 1945, extremely poor country. Um, you know, the Ho Chi Minh goes out to uh, speak and say, you know, we are trying to build a democracy here, guys. You know, uh, we got a tough road ahead of us. Four years later, China, very poor country, had just come out of a war from, uh, you know, that started in the 1920s. Okay, uh, well, but in fact, deepened 
in 1937 with the Marco Polo incident. From 37 to 40, it's the longest Second World War on the planet. That was 49. Cuba, 1959, and so on. You know, we can go on. Anyway, all backward poor countries. Now, you got to judge these experiments based on where they're coming from and what they were able to do in the condition of backwardness, particularly given right after these revolutions happened, there was an attempt to suffocate them. The Soviet Union was invaded by the white armies. You know, somebody like Mr. Piketty making a loose statement like that, callous statement, doesn't grasp the gravity of what they're saying. You know, he's sitting in his office in Paris, make, you know, making a brushing away the fact that Paris might have been occupied by the Nazis, if not for uh, the Soviet armies in the 1940s. If the Soviets hadn't come in and crushed the Nazi war machine in the Eastern Front, you know, Mr. Piketty would have to be teaching, you know, the collected works of Hitler uh, in his office in France. So there's a kind of, of, you know, banal callousness in some of this. And I'm speaking bluntly to you because it's irritating. Um, yeah. you know, it's irritating to have a responsible intellectual so dismissive about complicated phenomena in world history. And I'm, I put the complexity first, Joe, this month, because people should understand that, that, you know, when... When Lenin gets into the Kremlin, he's dealing with a country which has collapsed, you know, where people are starving and they, ha and they were invaded. Um, there were internal challenges and so on. Uh, and the advances that the Soviet Union made are better judged by a liberal like Jawaharlal Nehru than a liberal by Thomas Piketty. Nehru goes to the Soviet Union in 1927, 10-year anniversary of the revolution. And he comes back to India and he writes a book called Soviet Russia. It's not much read. And in fact, I'm, I keep thinking I want to republish the book because what Nehru says in that is he says, look, this reminds me of India. You know, uh, we go to rural Russia and it's just like rural India. The difference is, he says, in 10 years, they've got people reading. He says, you go into small uh, villages and there's a library. You know, people are coming and they're proud of their, their literacy campaign because that was the heart of the revolutionary process. Same in China, the literacy campaign. Um, within decades, these places eradicated literacy. When India won its independence, the literacy rate was 12%. Okay, 12%. Um, you know, I would like to ask Mr. Piketty, what was the literacy rate in Algeria in 1962 when the Algerians threw the French out? Um, you know, now you'll tell me, well, the Ar Algerian struggle for independence was also useless. Um, truly, you know, what, what, is, what is the uh, condition now in Burkina Faso, in Mali, all ex-French colonies? You know, let's talk about that. Um, you see, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be evasive. I'm being direct. I'm saying that to dismiss something like the Soviet Union or the Cuban Revolution or the Vietnamese Revolution without understanding that these are places where the social indicators were so deleterious to human life and that the revolution made it its commitment to improve those conditions above all else. Of course, there were a million problems, you know, million. In the Soviet Union, one of the classic problems, which everybody talks about, is violations of socialist democracy. Um, you know, they routinely violated their own constitution. Uh, that's an issue. And any socialist experiment that puts a legal framework into play must honor that legal framework. You know, that's got to be the basis of, of your governance. Um, Soviets struggled with that, you know, and I'm, I'm not saying this is about this person or that person. It's convenient. Oh, Stalin did this or that. It's nonsense. Um, the system struggled with socialist democracy. If you go and read the very great Soviet jurist, Evgeny Pashukhanis, you get an understanding of how complicated it is to move from a law, legal system based on private property rights to a new kind of legal system. And they, they, they flubbed that. And therefore, the state was used sometimes aggressively against people. Um, so yeah, there are problems. I, I don't evade them. But to say that the Soviet Union was something that, you know, you wish it didn't happen, in other words, uh, although he didn't exactly say that. Right. Um, I think is 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 immature if you don't mind me. Hi, my name is Ayushman. I, along with Jotisman, have started this platform. In the last two years, we have tried to build content for the left and progressive forces. 
we have interviewed economists, historians, political commentators, and activists so far. If you have liked our content so far and want us to build an archive for the left, I have two requests for you. Please do consider donating for the cause. Link is in the description below. Also, if you are not able to do so, don't feel sad. You can always like our videos and share our videos to your comrades. Finally, don't forget to hit the subscribe button.